All right, this is the Nor Hour, and I'm sitting here with Mike Hideous of Empire Hideous and so many other bands. Mike, what's up? Hello, Tyler. How are you, buddy? I'm good, man. I'm I am drained to say the least. You and me both. This is my first day back to work after a oh, long yeah. vacation. How long was the vacation for? It was ten days. That's the longest vacation I've ever taken. <laughs> oh my god. It was awesome. <laughs> Good. I haven't been on vacation since 2002. God damn. Well, yeah. I think it's time for one. Yeah. And I was going to go to the West Coast uh, next year in uh, May. But with the way things are right now, there's no way I'm going. Oh, yeah. You're um, going to you're gonna go see Deacon, right? I was going to go visit Deacon. I was going to go... Um, I was going to go up the road, visit a few friends I have in L.A. Then I was going to go to the Redwood Forest so I can hug a tree. Yeah. And then I was going to go to San Francisco, visit another friend. Then I was going to go all the way up to um, Seattle, visit a friend that I have there. And then while in Washington State, there's another friend of mine, Jake Hades, who's got a band called The Hades Machine. Him and I were going to drive to Montana and go to the Badlands in Montana. And there's a section in the Badlands where you can literally find dinosaur bones, like like practically sticking right out of the ground. So one of my kick the bucket list things is I want to find a dinosaur bone. While we're out there, we're also going to search for a meteorite. I always wanted to find a meteorite, something that fell from outer space. And while I'm out there, uh, you may or may not know this, but I am a photographer. So I wanted to get a photograph of the Milky Way. Uh, you know, one of those scenes, one of those shots where you see like the stars kind of turning in, right. in a circle or something. And when you get you, you get focused on the, the North Star and then you kind of just do a time lapse uh, photograph. Anyhow, yeah. <clears throat> I was hoping to get a shot of that and the Milky Way. But as I was saying... I don't think it's going to happen because the way gas prices are, there's no way I'm going to drive from the bottom of California to the top of America in Washington with gas prices at $6 a fucking gallon in, in California. No way. It's terrible. No way. It is. It's, it's, it is an ungodly sin, a shame. And I don't even believe in God, but it's an, a shame what's happening as a result of this administration and what they're doing to this country. They're literally trying to wipe out capitalism. There, there's no, no doubt in my mind. Well, it won't, it won't stop for a while. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll, hopefully a lot of that stuff won't pass. You know, it, it'll be reversed. I'm trying to stay positive. I've quit watching the news. I, I was watching the news every day. You know, I've got a show that I watch and, uh, I can't do it anymore. After I don't blame after, you. after when I was on vacation, I I turned off all the notifications for it, and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna live life, and it's best not you know I won't stay in the dark too much, but shit's too rough right now. But yeah. but you are you are an apocalypse guy. Yes, I am. But you know what? You I'm kind of in the same boat you are. I can't. I can't listen. I don't watch television. Um, the only TV I have, I've Netflix, so I watch movies. But I don't watch cable television, news programs, or anything like that. Um, so when I get my news information, I get it from the radio. There's there's one particular show that I listen to, where I get all the political information that I need. And I can't even listen anymore because it's driving me out of my fucking skull. I, I I'm literally disgusted every day by what I hear about what's happening to this country as a result of this administration. Yeah, it's tough. Ugh. It is. And, you know, I don't know if you know this or not, but uh, I used to be a Democrat. I used to be a politically correct, liberal Democrat. And um, when Obama became president, I'm sorry, when Obama became king of the world, uh, I, I couldn't take that. I, I, I didn't like him. I didn't trust him. And I saw what the Democratic Party was doing. 
and I, I had to I had to step back. Now I'm not a Republican, but at the same time I'm I'm not a Democrat either. And here's what I say to anybody who is a Democrat who has issues with Republicans. If you really want to understand politics, do what I did. Listen to what your opposition has to say. Before you make any sort of a a decision on whether you think Republicans are better or Democrats are better, listen to the other side. Listen to what they have to say. Don't listen to the news. Don't listen to what like uh, uh, CNN or MSNBC, any of those major news companies have to say because you won't be told the truth. The media is full of shit. They are full of shit. So if you really want to understand what's going on, listen to the politicians that you hate and listen to what they have to say before you make a decision. Now, again, I'm not a Republican, but I'll never be a Democrat again. Never, never. Yeah. Well, it, it's it's hard not to talk about. I mean, it, oh, of it, course. at every turn, it's hard not to talk about these things because we're, we're so impacted. I mean, the impact is so real. And it's so tough. It's, it's the. I mean, that's what everybody's talking about around the water cooler. I know that for sure. That's right. It, it, there's not a person who I am in touch with that doesn't discuss politics with me at some point or another. It, it comes up in every conversation with every person that I speak with. Yeah, it's really sad. Well, we're just gonna hope for the best on that. Yeah. Anyway, I got you here, man. I want to talk to you about your music career. I want sure. to talk to you about, I've really, uh, I've really been diving deep. Um, last week, I played Parasite's Bible on the Noor yeah. Hour. And I love that song. Man, as soon as the drums kick in, I'm hooked on that shit. It's been stuck in my head all week. Nice. I don't know what it, some, some of the music that you've made. Thank you. It's, uh, it's just fucking incredible, really. I, and it's weird to me that I didn't, I didn't know about it. I feel like there's, a, I feel like there's a huge demographic of people out there that don't know about Empire Hideous. They don't know about Spa Society. They don't know about, you know, the Bronklin Casket Co. Yep. When you were in it, I mean, there's a lot Bronx, of these Bron- Bronx Casket Company. Oh yeah, Bronx. Sorry, I keep <laughs> saying I, I, I keep wanting to call it Brooklyn, but I, I know that's wrong. But. <laughs> yeah, that's Bronx Casket. But man, the the Bronx the Bronx casket that's that's some good shit. I mean, it's very doomy. It um, it doesn't seem like something that you would do because it's just really it's really doomy and kind of metal, kind of halftime. I, I would well, and I and I can tell you right off the bat, I was I, I'm not a metal guy. I, I was never really into metal. Don't get me wrong; there are some metal bands I really like uh, and that I still listen to this day. But I was like some people, you know, they're so into it that like they're religiously always listening to something metal. I'm just not that guy. Uh, I grew up mostly. Uh, I mean, I started out with heavy metal when I was young. Excuse me one second. Cat, get out of here. Uh, I started out when I was young, my, like, you know, 13, listening to heavy metal, ACDC, Judas Priest, Kiss, uh, Van Halen. Uh, who else? Uh Oh God, I can't remember everybody, but you know, that was my influences at 13. But then I got into new wave, Gary Newman, the B-52s, Flock of Seagulls, Psychedelic Furs, all that stuff you probably hate. Then from there, I I love it. You do good, good. I'm glad to hear you have an open mind. Then I got into punk rock and I was into punk rock for a few, year, few years, and then I got into what's called hardcore punk rock, which, and I became what, what's known as straight edge. No drugs, no, uh, no, drugs, no sex, no d- alcohol, right. hardcore. Uh, so yeah, and hardcore back in the 80s was like, <laughs> it, I mean, it, hardcore back in the 80s was a, a type of music that would kill emo. <laughs> kill it and eat it um so uh i got into that and then from there i got into death rock and then gothic rock and that's and now today i listen to anything from big band uh the old style crooners jazz um 
classical. Uh, I, I got a huge collection of, of um, uh, scores from movies and stuff like that. So I'm very versatile, but I will not listen to rap or country. Uh, I, <clears throat> there's some country that so, but uh, rap is a definite no. Uh, I can't do it. When it when I first hear it come on, it just sends bad vibes all over me. I just I can't stand it. But I was going to ask you what you know what what are you listening to? You know your, some of your favorite bands and you know kind of what inspired you. What inspired me for what? What inspired you in your uh, in your music? You know in your writing. Um, well. <clears throat> When I started Empire Hideous back in, oh my God, 1987, 88, 87, maybe, probably more like 87. I think it was the summer of 87 when my friend Don and I got together. He was a guitar player and I had a keyboard, this Casio keyboard, this cheap little keyboard. And we would, just, we took it up to my radio and we yeah. would just... You know, we would just, I would come up with these tunes and um, I just wanted to write music and I didn't know a goddamn thing about music. I never wrote a song before. I never sang a song before. I never played an instrument. I never wrote lyrics, nothing. So it was all new for me. Uh, prior to that, I was an artist. You know, I, I painted and I, 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 I drew pictures and crap like that. And I just wanted a different canvas. So at the time, I was into bands like Alien Sex Fiend, uh, The Misfits, uh, TSOL, uh, Minor Threat, uh, who else? The FUs. Um, some of the, like, the darker stuff was, like, mostly Alien Sex Fiend and TSOL. And yeah. um, so when I got together with my guitar player, uh, my vision of what we were going to make was uh, in the veins of Alien Sex Fiend, which is a, was, is a British old school bat cave style music band. So um, that's what I thought it was going to turn out to be, but it didn't. Uh, we ended up getting this, this trio, a bass player, a guitar player, and a drummer who were all working together. And they joined up with Don and I, and we formed the first lineup of the Empire Hideous. And it was more, it, like when I listened to the early music, it was, in my opinion, it was it was like it was like we were all at a bus stop. Everybody was into different styles of music. Um, the bass player was into like funk, um, like the Red uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers. The guitar player. <laughs> Danny was into virtuoso music like uh, Ingve Malmsteen and Billy Sheehan, like, you know, the guitar virtuosos, uh, which I couldn't stand back then. I, I mean, that was that sounds I, like I our guitar player. <laughs> Doug, I just, he's I just all, can't. He's all, about, all into he, it. He's all into prog rock. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's good and all. I just I just never liked it. And then the the drummer, I mean, he was sort of wishwashy. He could go either way, but he sort of fell into like the the style of like the cult Bauhaus. And then of course it was Don and myself who, at the time, by that point in time, we were into Sisters of Mercy, the Mission UK, uh, who else? Um, Susie and the Banshees, uh, and you know the, the Gothic rock bands, Bauhaus, Peter Murphy. Yeah. Um, so while I was trying to become like David Bowie. The other guys really didn't have the same um, the same vision that I did. I wanted to be a rock star. I wanted to get to a level in music where I was I, I made a name for myself. But the other guys, you know, they were they didn't care like I did. They they didn't they didn't really have the 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 get up and go like I did. Yeah. Uh, you know, I booked the shows, I wrote the music, I paid for the recordings, I paid for the first uh, 12 inch record that I had made. Um, you know, I, I was doing I was making stickers, I was making flyers, I was booking shows, I was doing it all and nobody else was really helping me. So eventually it became obvious that I was the only one really 
who I mean, Empire Hideous was me. Yeah, it, it was me. So I was influenced by <laughs> gothic rock by the time Empire Hideous was really starting to play out, you know, and we didn't start playing out until about 1980, 89. We started in 88 rehearsing. In 89, we played, I think we played a, about a year and a half worth of shows and then the guys quit. And then I had a, I had a start promoting, uh, how to wait, let me rephrase that. I had to, I had to sell a record that I had no band to use to, to, to promote. Um, so it was very tough back then. When I look back on those days, I'm glad that the first, the first lineup didn't remain because we were, we would have never gotten anywhere. Yeah. Well, you've been, you've been through a lot of band members. Oh my God. More than you can imagine. I, I noticed because, you know, I, I see the post and there it's, there's so many different people in the empire hideous at one time or another. Yep. Which, you know, that's something we all struggle with, but man, you have really taken it on the chin with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, 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 it was, we used to say that there was a revolving door in empire hideous and like musicians would come in for a month and then leave. And a lot of times the guys, like a lot of the guitar players or, or bass players that we, or even drummers that we'd get would come in for like a month and then they'd quit, and then they tell everybody, "Oh yeah, I played an Empire Hideous." Oh, what did you play? You you rehearsed for a month and then you quit. Yeah, you know they weren't serious. They weren't as they weren't as driven as myself. And eventually, when I got there were there were three musicians that I ended up getting it who who really stayed with me for I think it was almost ten years. I got Mars on guitar, Eve on bass, and Jeff on guitar. And those guys stayed with me from 19, well, let's say 1990, let's see, 92, 92 until 98. So eight years, eight years. Well, like I said, I've been listening to Empire Hideous a lot. You know, I, I got those CDs that you sent to Tom or whatever. Um, so I got, I got some of those, but I've also been digging and I realize it's, it's really hard to find your music, yep. on, you know, in some, in some respects, mm -hmm. you know, you've got, you got body of work on Spotify, which I think a lot of people go there. I know I do, but I've really been digging back in and um, I'm thinking that say your prayers, that, that whole album. I mean, that's, that's some of my favorite stuff on there. Uh, if only I kept dreaming mm. that song. Oh man, I've been listening to it over and over. It's, it's so good. Um, thank you. Thank you. Really enjoy that song. Thank you. And I think, I think we can all relate to that. I, it's, it's, I've really enjoyed it. I don't know how thank else to you. say, um, and the dead season. Tell me about that song. <clears throat> In 1994, yeah, in 1994, in February, uh, I'm sorry, in February of 1995, a very good friend of mine died, drug overdose, and his name was Jack Pavlik, and Jack was, he was in a band called Sweet Convulsions, like an industrial kind of band, industrial punk. Um, and him and I, when we first met, like he was a lead singer and when he and I first met, I mean, our egos clashed incredibly. <laughs> I hated that guy. He hated me, but we ended up becoming really good friends. Um, and he taught me so much. He used to work at this arts and entertainment weekly newspaper. And, uh, he taught me the art of self-promotion and Jack, he, he was, he was also a homosexual and I had never had a homosexual friend. Uh, and yeah. by the, at the time, at that time I was married, I was married. My wife and I were, um, you know, married at what a year before I met him. And, um, he, he really opened my eyes into being, more 
how would I put it? Open minded. Uh, well, you said that was ninety five, right? It, yeah, February ninety five so so, is when he died. So we're, talk- so we're talking about a totally different world than we live in right now. Just for everybody that listens, that's, that's right. Ninety five was the landscape isn't even the same. No, not now even close. It was that's right. So. Uh, long story short, though, Jack taught me a lot, and when he died, I was the last person. Excuse me. <coughs> I was the last person to speak with him on the phone. And what happened was he had, he had gotten out of, it was uh, Valentine's day, February 14th. He had just gotten out of being in detox for a month and he gets out of detox. He calls me that night, but I was, I was in rehearsal until like 3 AM and, um, when I got the when I got the message, he left this message for me. Mike called me back, so I you know I was like you know what I'll call him tomorrow. The next day, I called him around three o'clock in the afternoon, and he was so fucked up, slurring his he was slurring his speech and like he could barely talk. And I I was kind of disappointed because I felt I knew he had a drug problem, right? And um, he ended up. I I told him, I said, listen, Jack, you know what? Just call me when you're sober. And he was, you know, trying to make, play it off like he wasn't, he wasn't high. Long story short, when he hung up, well, when I hung up the phone, I thought, I thought I had completely severed the line and he hung up. But when, when I hung up the phone, he didn't hang up. And every time I kept picking up the phone, like it was still a deadline. We were still connected. Right. What happened to him? He had taken so many drugs that he ended up passing out after he talked to me, put the phone down and literally went into a coma and died. And Holy uh, shit. yeah, when they found him, they found the he was when he was found dead. He still had the phone in his hand. So. Where am I going with this whole story? When I lost Jack as my friend, um, I wrote the song Dead Season, sort of ode to Jack. Yeah. That's that's where it came from. Well, I think when I listen to music, you know, I'm always looking for pain, you know. I mean, that's what we, li- you know, I think you and I, if we're, if we're listening to music, we're looking for, you know, real emotion. I think emotion is... You know, you don't find emotion in a whole lot. And, uh, you know, with goth rock and with metal, I mean, you'll find it. And that song really stuck out because I've been listening to it. And then, and the fact that it's acoustic as well, I mean, it really, you know, it grabbed me up. So I was just kind of curious because I heard a lot of pain and emotion and shit in that. And I, which is probably why I gravitated to it. So. That's that's a hell of a story. I didn't think yeah. I didn't think I was going to get that kind of a story, but that's it's just about just about every song. I mean, not to brag or anything. I'm just saying, if we're talking about where I get my inspirations from, yeah, just about every song I write comes from a personal experience. Just about. Yeah. Well, I've definitely enjoyed them. I tell you, one that I've really liked is a uh, Pretty Faces. I uh, thank you. <clears throat> that's going to be. I'm going to play that soon. Um, I really like pretty faces. I really like moving in stereo. The song that you did. The cover. If you want to talk about that a little bit, but well, uh, uh, all right. So I'm going to tell you something. I don't know if you know this, but uh, and I'm sure your 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 fa- your listeners don't know this, but the last studio album I recorded for uh, Empire Hideous was called "The Time Has Come." While I was recording that record, and by the way, it took four years to complete because of, uh, I, I'm not even going to get into, that's a whole other story. It took four years to complete that album. At the time, I was doing a film, a documentary about my history as a musician, because I was stepping out of music. It was in 2008, I was retiring from music. I was done. I, I, I couldn't keep a band together. As, as I said before, revolving doors with musicians coming in and out. I was like, fuck it, I'm done. I can't do this anymore on my own 
as an independent musician without financial backing. I just can't do it. Yeah. So I said, you know, I'm done. I'm going to quit. So as I'm writing the album, we're doing this film. We did an interview of Peter Steele from Typo Negative. I can see the poster on your wall, October Rust, my favorite album. Yeah. Um, so Peter was living out here in Pennsylvania in Scranton. So we go to the house and we do the interview and Peter asks me, he's like, Mike, what are you, what are you doing with Empire Hideous these days? And I'm like, Peter, I'm done. I'm doing my last album. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, um, uh, fulfill the, the, the record contract that I have with this independent label called Hell's Hundred Records. And I'm done. I, I can't do it anymore. He said to me, do you need any help? I said, yeah. I said, would you like to produce it? He's like, I would love to. I said, perfect. I said, listen, I'll send you the stuff. You listen to it. You know, I'll send you the, the, the demos, uh, uh, what we've got recorded, the lyrics, and so on and so forth. And you tell me what you think. So he was going to produce the album. And one of the favorite records, a uh, favorite record, one of the favorite bands him and I had in common was the, the band The Cars, Rick Ocasek, The Cars. Yeah. And the song, they're from their first album called Moving in Stereo. So Peter and I, we were like, he said, you should, you should do a cover. And I'm like, yeah, well, we were thinking about doing this. He's like, oh, I love that song. You should do that. So we recorded this song, but um, regret, regrettably, while Peter was working on doing uh, pre-production on my record, The Time Has Come, he had uh he went into cardiac arrest well actually i shouldn't say that he began having heart problems uh like he had pains in his chest his girlfriend came home called the ambulance the ambulance came to get him they took him outside and in the ambulance outside of his apartment is where he died he went into cardiac arrest and died so peter in a sense Though he was working on pre-production for my record, he ended up having chest pains, heart problems, and eventually dying. Uh, you can essentially say while working on my record. <clears throat> yeah. Well, that's terrible, man. We, I know we miss Pete. Uh, I don't know. I don't think there would be an October Nor if Peter was still here, but I think I'd rather have Peter around. You know, <laughs> but that's kind of where we, well, you know, Tom just had the idea to keep, you know, kind of keep the sound going. So, <clears throat> which, yeah, anybody who man, likes being, typo negative is going to like October Nor. Yeah. This has been like the biggest, my, the most, the, my most favorite project I've ever done. I mean, I love this, this band and, you know, there's not a lot of people that like that sound you know, in locally where I'm at. So I fit right in. I mean, I've always loved it. Um, yeah. It's a sad thing about rock and roll and heavy metal is that I sincerely believe that rock and roll is dying slowly in this <sighs> country. And it, you know, you know, you still got the big bands that are out there that still play and still pull in, you know, thousands of people at an arena or, or, or a venue. But, America, what America does with music is it shoves shit down everybody's throat and tells you, listen to this, you're going to like this. And it's basically like they'll take a band that sounds like, I don't know, I don't know who's popular these days. What, what's a popular band? I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. All right, so let's, let's just say, for argument's sake, let's just say Lamb of God or yeah. uh, like Deftones or something or even Marilyn Manson. And what they'll do, the record labels will search for a band that sort of imitates that very sound of other bands, and then they they sign them and they, yeah. they sort of market that sound. But on another note, what is more popular than rock and roll in America? Do you know that answer? I'll tell you that answer. Rap. Rap, Rap yeah. and hip-hop. And for the record, <clears throat> I fucking hate rap. OK, it's bullshit. 
my asshole could write a better song with rap uh, of rap music. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I could I rap out of my ass and, and do a great fucking song because rap takes no talent whatsoever. That's they terrible. Don't, they don't sing. Their lyrics are, are nothing but criminal ghetto fucking bullshit. There's no poetic anything to it. People uh, say, oh, it's poetic justice and it's, 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 it's ghetto uh, uh, rap uh, poet, poet, poetry. And to me, I'm sorry, but rhyming a word with yo and Joe is not, <laughs> is not no. it, it, that's not the way to, uh, to rhyme. <laughs> That's, I mean, it's, that's, it's a child's way of rhyming. Well, and, and, it, and the most, the most popular rap lately has been the mumble rap stuff. They, they don't even say anything at all. It's yeah, just look, a bunch of, uh, it, look, look at, look at what's his name? Lil John. The guy goes, okay. Oh yeah. Okay. I mean, I mean, when I, yeah, right, man. don't you I, wish I, you would have done that? Oh <laughs> yeah. And they're making fucking millions and it makes me sick to my stomach. Sick to my stomach, but you know, here, here's you know you got a band like that, a band, a band. You got a a, a a a rap group like that, and then they they do songs. Did you ever hear that song? Shots, shot, shot, oh, yeah. shot, 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 shot. That's 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 Everybody. the whole song. And yeah, and that's then the and then they song. say there, there's a there's a there's a there's a, a a line of of lyrics in the song that says uh, something about the ladies. Uh, uh, they, what are they? How does it go? They, 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 something. They, they. Oh, fuck. How's it go? I couldn't tell you. I'll tell you in a second. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. They need an excuse to suck our cocks. That 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 was the line. I, I mean mm. that, that and 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 I hear people listening to that with their fucking kids, and I'm well, like, are you kidding well, me? Yeah, and the problem is they they probably won a Grammy for that. Of course they did. And, and that's my point. In America, in America, you don't have record labels that sign bands because they are artistically good. No, you have them signing shit rap bands because that's what's popular. And they shove it down your throat. They shove it down the public's throat. They play it on the radio every fucking hour if you listen to the radio. And they make you like it. Thank goodness I never got into rap music because I could I can't deal with it. It's it's bullshit yeah. to me. It's it's the worst fucking music out there. It's it's in it's it's uneducated. It's inferior. There is no there's no meaning to it. There's no essence to it. It's bullshit. Yeah. I mean it's and, it's hard to it's, it's, it's been hard for me in my past to respect people that listen to it. I, and, you know, not to be <laughs> offensive to anybody, but holy shit. I am. I I'm mean, offensive to it. <laughs> how, can, how can you listen to that and then, I don't know. I it's, not the cure, it. it's not the cure, I tell you that. Oh, of course not. Of course not. And, and again, compare the cure to even Snoop Dogg, who I actually like more than any other hip-hop music at least he's got music to his 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 writing but yeah there's they don't play their own instruments as i said their lyric their lyrical context context is inferior it's childish at most uh you know and then you compare that to a band like the cure who play their instruments who write their own songs who sing in harmony with the 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 instruments that are being played there's rap there's no there's no singing in the rap yeah. i think i think the only rapper that i've that i've really liked is uh was ice t that's got oh. body count oh god <laughs> well i have you heard have I you heard him. body count yeah i heard that isn't he the guy uh a uh, cop killer uh, uh f- yeah uh, fuck yeah. cops yeah yeah well, I, I mean, I mean well, I give him I give him respect because he does actually have a band, and you know they I mean they they they're more like you know they're hardcore kind of like hate breed or so, but I mean he can do both. That's that's fine. I, I, you know what, dude? I I have to say, going back into the eighties, the mid eighties, about nineteen eighty six, eighty seven, 
when Anthrax started incorporating rap music with heavy metal. Yeah. I hate them for that. I hate them for that. I actually yeah. like the first Anthrax album, Fistful of Metal. I like that album. It was fucking, it was awesome. It was a great album. But then you had them come out, and I can't remember what the album was. It was just like this rap shit. Like yeah. a cross between the Beastie Boys meets Slayer. And I'm like, this is fucking horrible. Yeah, I can't disagree with you on that. I, it, I it's sad I that music... Fan. It's sad that music took that turn, like 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 heavy metal or rock and roll, if you will, took that turn into this crossover rap metal. I think they even called it new metal. Was that new metal? Oh yeah, yeah. I bands know, like Corn and Limp Biscuit and well, Corn not so much. I mean, Corn like I actually liked Corn. Uh, you know, very powerful, powerful band. I think a band probably I could use to describe that would be Rage Against the Machine. Um, oh, shit. You know, they, they kind of... I hate that band. I, yeah, I can't... Yeah, I, I have never, <laughs> I've never had a taste for that. I, I don't know what it is. When Tom Morello is on his guitar and he's just squealing around, it just pisses me off. I, <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not good. But, <clears throat> you know, 10 million others disagree, so... Right, and as I said, it, it's because... It was shoved down our throats. It was shoved down the, 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 the fans' throats, and they were told, you will like this. And that's what happened. It, it well, became not, a new sensation. No, and especially not, not me. Uh, I, I'm very old school. I'm, I'm very hard to please. I'm uh, a very angry, jaded person. So <laughs> the music I like is, um, it, 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 it goes back to the 80s. What can I tell you? Yeah. Well, the older I get, the more I'm going back to older music. So that lets you know that there's not a whole lot of good coming out of today's music. Um, right. And the older I get, the more I'm the old, you know, the angry man I become, the pissed off guy on his lawn, you know, <laughs> that type. Get off my grass. Yeah. Well, we talked about Empire Hades a little bit. I want to talk about Spy Society. Oh. First of all, I want to get, let's see, I want to get like an order of these bands, you know, like I'm sure Empire Hideous was first, but then, you know, you had, I guess you were in the Misfits and then Spy Society came after. And then I guess the Bronx Casket Company came last or. Well, I'll explain to you what happened. Obviously, Empire Hideous was first. It was my brainchild. I did Empire Hideous for 10 years from 1988 until 1998 and in 1998 i broke the band up because uh at the time my drummer was going to quit and I, I just i couldn't go through another change i was like you know i, I i've had it i and that was my goal i, I was going to work for 10 years on my band and if i didn't get to the level that i wanted to be i was going to quit and that is exactly what happened so in 19 in february of 1998 on february 15th 1998 we played our last show february march april in april i went to a horror convention in new jersey and i bumped into jerry only uh their drummer david or chud uh and um the manager at the time whose name was kenny jerry's brother and we were talking and they told me they were having trouble with michael graves and uh, uh, I told him, I said, well, you know, you should have picked me when I auditioned or when I wanted to audition. You yeah, didn't let me audition. Have. I said, it, it, you know, because I was I was the man. I was the I was the Misfits fan. I had every record. I knew all the songs. I had the haircut. I had you know, I was the, the living, walking ghoul. Long story short, I get the position. I, I become the lead singer of the Misfits, right? So, because they knew I didn't have Empire Hideous, so they, they picked me. I go on tour, uh, two international tours. When I come back from that whole thing, I had already known Dee Dee Verney of Overkill. And Dee Dee was starting up a side project called the Bronx Casket Company. In addition, at the same time, 
after I got out of the Misfits, I started up a band called Spy Society 99. Okay. And when I did that, even though I didn't have a direction for the band when I first started that that project in September of 1998, by the time the following year came around, we had a whole look. The, the you know suits, black ties, white shirts, pulled our hair back, wore black sunglasses. The whole uh, espionage, secret agent, spy kind of thing. Right. And at the same time, D.D. Verney wanted to start a, He wanted to start this metal band in the veins of Black Sabbath and Typo Negative called Bronx Casket Company. He asked me to sing. Now, I'm not really a metal, heavy metal vocalist, performer. I never well, have. I disagree. I'd have to disagree with that. <laughs> And a lot of people do because, like, they look at Empire Hideous and they call Empire Hideous a cross between heavy metal and punk or heavy metal and gothic rock, which it is definitely gothic rock. Yeah. But I never saw it as a as a metal band. Anywho. Uh, so, you know, I, I start this band up or actually Dee Dee starts his band up and asks me to sing for him. And at first. It was strictly vocals, you know, like he, he paid me to sing for the record. And the first album we did was um, a self-titled album. The second album we did was called Sweet Home Transylvania. And the third album we did was called Electric. And... The whole time, for all three albums, he didn't let me write any lyrics. And I was really disappointed about that because had he let me write lyrics, I felt that I could have given him more. I yeah. could have given him more of myself as a singer and a performer. But it had something to do with publishing, and he didn't want to share any of that. There's only one song that I wrote lyrics for, and it's on the last album, Electric, and it's called, um, <laughs> what the hell is it called? <laughs> uh, I, I, it's called I Live for Death. And it was the only song that I got to write, lyrics I got to write for Bronx Casket Company. And, and at that point, I, I was just like, you know what, this, this is a waste of time. Um, we played one show in Virginia. Uh, as a matter of fact, I got the poster right behind me. You can't see it though. Um, at a place called Jack's. Where was that? I think it was in Virginia. Um, and, uh, you know, we played once. I had one day to rehearse with the band. And it, it was only like for an hour. And then we like spent the last two hours trying to adjust the vocals. It, it's like I had no rehearsal. Uh, so the, to, for me, the show was horrible. Yeah. Anyway, you know, it's interesting. A lot of these questions you're asking me and I don't mean to, I'm not trying to like deter you from asking them, but a lot of the questions you're asking are actually going to be answered in my upcoming book. The third version of my autobiography, my musical autobiography, yeah. which is, which, called I'm, King which I'm waiting to get, I'm waiting to get it. So. It's, it's going to be called King of an Empire to the Shoes of a Misfit. And it is only going to be available on MikeHideous.com. That's it. Yeah. Well, when are you, uh, I tell you what, when I order one, I'm going to need one autograph from you. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Because you got my phone or, number. What do you need an autograph for? <laughs> uh, well, it's, well, it's, it's cool, man. I, I like stuff I, like that. I, I'm flattered. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, well, I mean, well, it just seems like the Bronx, you know, you you weren't fulfilling, I guess. I way. wasn't. I mean, I wasn't. The music, the music is awesome. Uh, Change the World, I think, is my favorite song. And I don't know why. It's just, it just, it's awesome. I love that song. <laughs> and I was going to ask you, you know, which you've already answered, but I was going to ask if you did the, any writing, but apparently not. You got that nope. one song. So. One song, that's it. And I had well, to practically beg Dee Dee for that because he had he had written all the demos. He had, you know, had all the music 
And then he, did, he there was a couple songs he didn't have completed with lyrics. And I, I said, Dee Dee, please, let me just write lyrics to one song, just one at least. And then for the next album, maybe you can consider letting me write more lyrics for yeah. more songs. And it never got that far. Well, speaking of speaking of the misfits, I know that I know you don't talk. I know that that's mainly what you usually have to talk about. But I was gonna want, I was gonna ask you, have you ever seen this? As a matter of fact, I have. That that's in uh, South America. I can't quite see it. Yeah. Where is it? Brazil. Uh, what's it say on the cover? The horror kid America never saw, and then on the back, where does it say it was recorded? Where where was it recorded? I think I think it's in uh, Chile. Chile. Okay, that's where they had the riot. Yeah, I got. I found this actually on eBay. I was wondering if you had ever seen that. Nope. I know they're out there, but no. Yeah. How when, much you pay for we that? When we went to New York, when we went to New York, when we didn't get to see you, I brought this with me because <sighs> I was gonna because I was gonna ask you the same question. Have you have you ever seen it? Look at the look at the cover. Yep. It's got tons of pictures of you. It's pretty fucking cool. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's obviously a bootleg. It says it's uh recorded right off the soundboard. Right. So it actually does sound pretty good. And what, what uh, I gotta ask you, what did you pay for that? Uh, I think I paid twenty bucks. Isn't that it's, great? It's on, it's on eBay. Yeah, and, Isn't that and you'll great? never it's, see. It, it, you'll never so, see any. It's of. so funny when you when you see bootlegs going for twenty five bucks a head or or pop, I should say, and and the musicians get squat. Well, what about the shirt? What about the shirt that you just posted? Oh, recently on my on my fan yeah. page. Yeah, yeah. So, uh. The year we went down to Mexico in 1998, uh, somebody took pictures of me on stage, and they used the pictures for the f- for the following year when the band went back in 1999 to play in Mexico in Mexico City, possibly at the Hard Rock Cafe. I don't even know, but um, they made a T-shirt with my face on it. And they made posters with my face on it. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so needless to say, the singer Graves was uh, pretty pissed off when he saw my face on the advertisements and and not his. What can I tell well, you? If, if you've never, well, I'm gonna send you this CD in your email. I'm gonna send you all the tracks so you can check it out. Oh, thank it you. It looks it looks awesome. By the yeah, way, yeah, it's a great looking. It's a great looking. Maybe- uh, I tell you what, I'm just gonna buy. I'm just gonna buy another one on eBay, and I'll I'll ship it to you. <laughs> just have the whole thing. You know, the funny thing is that 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 slogan, "The Horror Kid America Never Saw," that was actually my idea. Yeah. Yep. Well, it's pretty cool. I tell you what, and, and a weird thing. Um, have you ever heard of a band called Aiden? No. They're a they're, they're a punk rock band. Um. The lead singer, his name's William William Francis. He goes by William Control now. He he does. He, Aiden stopped making music, and um, he does kind of like dark wave synth pop music. It's really good. He he doesn't do it anymore. But every time I look at you and the Misfits, you would have to go and Google Aiden. Uh, they were on Victory Records. And look at William Control, and look at his look. I mean, it looks a lot like Mike Hideous, circa '98. It's <laughs> it's weird. Nice. It's almost like he he took it. But Aiden, when they came out, they were a punk emo band. And you know, as they progressed, they got more rock and punk. But every time I look at every time I look at those pictures, I think about William Control and like. Because he was big in the Misfits too, and I know that's very random. That's only like something a nerd like me would talk about. But you'll have to <laughs> you'll have to look at old. You'll have to Google Aiden and check out some old pictures of them. They really they did the Mike Hideous look. Did they? So it, yeah, yeah. You'll have to you'll have to let me know if I was right. I'll tell that, you. But. I I, I got to tell you a little story. Shortly after the Misfits, about a year later, nineteen ninety nine. I knew I had reached a uh, 
a level of stardom, if you will. Let me let me finish. Hang on. Before you, but everybody thinks I'm a egotistical asshole. I knew I had to reach a level of stardom. In my town, I was driving home one day on Halloween. And I'm driving back to my studio where I lived. And uh, <laughs> I saw a kid dressed up as Mike Hideous for Halloween. He had the black hat on, the long black jacket. He had an Empire Hideous shirt on. He did the makeup like me. And I was like, that's it. I said, I've made it. I'm a Halloween decoration. <laughs> oh, man. If only so that, you would have had a picture of that. <laughs> that was the greatest thing. I was like, oh, my God. I always wanted somebody to dress up as me for Halloween. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was well, speaking of the hat, I was, thinking about, I was thinking about you when I was in Tennessee because there's so many hat shops and – they had a lot of Minnetonka hats. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, I got to go there. I need a new hat. I need a new hat, man. Yeah. I need a new hat. Yeah. Um, I got I got, I got, got a hat. I got the Buffalo Nickel hat. Oh, really? And, uh, I, yeah, I wore that all through Nashville, which I've had it for a while. But uh, I like the I was Buffalo thinking about, Nickel I was hat. thinking about you. I was like, ah, you, would, you would love it because yeah, it was a hat one guy. shop. It was one shop, and they had all kinds of. And I was looking and looking, but they they were out of my size. So, where is this in Tennessee? You said? Oh yeah, it's in downtown Nashville. It's a total tourist trap, but mm. it was pretty cool. Excuse me. Oh, you're not boring me. I just I had a very late night. Um, <laughs> uh, I've you know at where I live, there aren't many places that you can get real nice leather cowboy hats you know you get yeah. these these kind of these knockoff ones that are like australian hats they're nice and all but they're not really like cowboy hats um and uh i i'm a hat person i wear hats every day i've been wearing hats since the 80s uh and and i picked up on that from my pop who was a hat guy who used to, everything from caps to <laughs> fucking sombreros <laughs> My pop loved hats, and I I kind of followed him in that vein. Yeah, I used to wear hats every day until I grew my hair out, and now they just don't fit right. I have. Oh, see, that's I the thing. A, you got to get hats when you got the hair because that's when they look good. Yeah, I have a I have a cowboy hat, and it's about this fucking wide, and it's ridiculous as hell. But I I love to wear it when I go go float down the river. You know, go tubing or whatever you know there's plenty of water around here so right but yeah well we've touched on a lot uh you know spa society 99 i've been listening to and and i'm gonna have to admit it took me it took me a a, a time or two to get into it because it's different when you first start when you first start listening to it you're like what the fuck am i exactly. listening to because it's <laughs> because it's i don't know how you i don't know how long it took to make that record, but there's, there's such a combination of what I would call horror punk and then jazz and there's lounge um, there swing, swing uh, lounge. Yeah. All of it. Yeah. I mean, that, it, there's that was so everything, much going that was everything I started listening to back then. I was getting, as I said, I started getting into jazz uh, swing lounge. I love lounge music. Um, uh, 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 like for example, like, uh, do you know who uh, Esquivel is? I don't. Esquivel was big in the late sixties, seventies. Um, and he would do what was called batch, uh, space age bachelor pad music. Uh, and it's just this crazy jazz, like really off the wall jazz. Um, and, and I, I just started getting into really, uh, how could I say just more contemporary music, if you will, um, again, jazz lounge, uh, big band. And again, that all came from my pop. I uh, you know, my yeah. pop was into all that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's, it kind of, kind of, when I think about it, you might think this is funny, but it kind of sounds like something that you would hear on American psycho when he cranked the volume up. <laughs> I mean, right. you know it, but I enjoy it. Um, and I got, I got, I got to tell you, I got to tell you all the lyric. Well, not all of the lyrics. I shouldn't say that. Most of the lyrics 
were actually written to be misfit songs. Really? Yeah. In fact, I'll tell you how that happened. On the plane to Rock, when we were coming back from Europe, Jerry said to me, we were on the plane. I remember this distinctly. Jerry said to me, start writing lyrics because when we get back home, we're going to start writing new music. Okay. So I started writing the lyrics. And uh, I came up with uh, An Eye for an Eye, Rise of the Insects, Every Man for Himself, uh, Killing You. Uh, what else? Um, I can't remember off the top of my head, but those songs were originally written to be misfit songs. And then, of course, when that didn't happen, I incorporated them. I kind of changed them a little bit and incorporated them into what became Spy Society or SS99. Yeah. Well, that's cool. I didn't know that. I well, really, yeah. I like Rise, Rise of the Insects. It's cool. And, uh, you know, Where Have You Been? I, it's just there's so you get so much on that album. And it, like, I, like I said, it took me a time or two to really be like, wow, this is because there's so much going on from song to song. It's not yep. very, it's not smooth. It's just, it's all over the place, but I, yeah. I did enjoy it. Yep. yep. Uh, Thank you. I love that album. I think spy society was my greatest invention for, musically. Yeah. I think, I think it outdoes empire hideous. I think it was one of the greatest projects, musical projects I ever came up with. Because it, I, I felt it was so marketable. I'll tell you, when I was doing that band, do you know who Reeves Gabrels is? Probably not. Reeves Gabrels Reeves Gabrels was the guitar player for David Bowie. Okay. He played he played for Bowie from Tin Machine back in the 80s, around 87, I believe it was, 86, 87. Then Bowie went and did he did more Bowie songs and um Bowie albums. And Reeves worked with him for, I think it was like 13, 14 years. When Reeves quit and went solo, I was working as a journalist for an arts and entertainment magazine. And I got a chance to interview him. When I interviewed him, after we were done, we were in passing. I told him, you know, I'm in a band myself. And I said, I'd love to send you a press kit and a demo and tell me what you think. So I sent them a four song CD that I had of, of SS 99 and, uh, Trevor, uh, Trevor, uh, Tyler, he, he listened to it and he, he got back to me and he said, I love this. He goes, not only do I want to produce your album, but I want to be in your band. David Bowie's guitar player was telling me. I want to produce your album and be in your band. I tell you, I couldn't have been more happy. I couldn't have been That's more crazy. happy. But I'm not going to tell you how that that story ends up. You have to read the book. Yeah, yeah. Don't don't give too much away. Well, anyway, also uh, 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 Gidget Gein, the guy from uh, Marilyn Manson, the the guitar player from Marilyn Manson, he had a band when he used to come see Spy Society play, and he had a band called the Dolly Gaggers. He wanted me to sing for them because he he's like he's like spy societies. He says it's it's fucking great. He goes, you got to sing for me, but yeah, that that's another story too. You can read about. All right, cool. Well, I plan on doing it. <laughs> well, look, man, I've I've really enjoyed. I'm glad that you sat down and talked to me. Um, of course, pleasure. I've been a big fan of you, and we we've talked before on the Michael Deacon program, and yes. I know that you're at. I consider you a huge friend of October Noor, you know, and it's been, you know, and I, I was thinking about it while I was on vacation. I was, you know, when I emailed you and we talked and I was like, man, I really need to, I really need to deep dive a little more than I have in the past, you know, and kind of, and I like what I, I like how it came out. I mean, I really enjoyed listening to that music. Uh, you know, I, <clears throat> the Bronx Casket Co., I really didn't. I didn't, you know, I knew that you were in them, but I, I never really listened to it. So I really enjoyed that too. Um, so it's cool. I'm glad that I'm glad you showed up to talk to me and, uh, ah, my pleasure. This has been, this has been fun. Um, I want to give you a chance to plug, plug some of your stuff. I you know, uh, you got a website, you do a lot of photography, you do a lot of art. So 
Sure. Kind of let everybody know about those places, where they can find you. Sure. Uh, if anybody's interested, I, I uh, co-host um, an internet radio show called the the Michael Deacon Program. Uh, you can find the um, the link on YouTube, the Michael Deacon Program. Um, I'm not always on, but when I am on, Michael and I have a great time. Um, and we cover all, you know, every bit of every spectrum of the rainbow. Um, so there's that. Uh, if you're interested in my music uh, and and my uh, some of my my darker art, um, you can go to MikeHideous.com and that's Mike with a Y. Uh, and you'll you know you can I still have CDs that are available, both downloadable and actual physical CDs. Uh, and I also have an entire line of art designs called horrible artwork. Um, it's in the merchandise section and t-shirts. I've got, uh, throw towels with Frankenstein and throw pillows with the uh, Phantom of the Opera. Cool stuff. Cool stuff. Uh, and also if you're interested in my artwork, um, uh, my more contemporary artwork and my photographs, which, um, you can buy either prints or originals. You can go to spy man photography. Oh, wait, is this? No, sorry. Start again. Spymanphotoandart.com. Yeah, that's it. Spymanphotoandart.com. And last but not least, if you're interested on social media, you can catch up with my latest happenings. Uh, and it's uh, facebook.com slash hideous Mike, M Y K E. That's it. Awesome. Hopefully they'll all remember that. I tell you what, when I when I put this on YouTube, I'll make sure and get all that stuff in the description so everybody can just go look at it. Thank you. But um, uh, well, Mike, it was great to talk to you, man. Uh, Likewise. We'll do it again soon. Hopefully, Please. I'll get back on the Deacon Show sometime. Yeah. You know, I've in doing this radio show and doing this podcast interview shit. Uh, I really kind of opened up. You know, back. I think the last time we talked, I was shit hammer drunk, you know, just <laughs> <laughs> because at the end of it, we had been on the phone. I had been on the phone for two hours and 40 something minutes and I just, I totally lost myself. I'll tell I, you, I don't, I don't know how you guys do it. Michael does it too. He drinks, he, he drinks beer. I can't, I, I, he I, sm- I, he smokes. Apparently he smokes more than anybody there is. <laughs> but I think Michael has a permanent bong hooked up to him. <laughs> I believe it. I just imagine but, him sitting at his computer with like <laughs> just a a straw coming out right here and yep. he's just lighting it up. I don't know how he does it, but he does it. So Well he never he never breaks stride either though. So it's no. it's it's cool. <laughs> I yeah, I see, would be a fucking mess. Me yeah, me, I, I can't I, I I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I smoke weed, um, but I only smoke it at night now. I don't, I don't, I used to smoke it socially. I used to go out, you know, in fact, before I even went into a club, the first thing I had to do was smoke a joint. I can't do that now. Now yeah. I'm an old fart and all I do is I'll, I'll smoke some weed before I go to bed and I'll just watch a movie and pass out. That's my, that's the extent of my life. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't think I've smoked in 12 years. I, it's not for me. It's it it not for everybody. Make me a for basket everybody. case. See, for me, I, I'm not a drinker. I don't like to drink. Um, yeah. I can't drink. I used to be able to drink, but I can't. I started in 2008. I started getting these terrible headaches, and now I just don't drink anymore. So for me, smoking weed is about the most excitement I'll have. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm hoping to I'm hoping to ease off of some of this stuff. So it's a it's a hard road. Well, look, man, Mike, I'm going to let you go. Uh, All right, Tyler. But once again, man, thank you so much for being here on the Noor Hour. And uh, Thank you. And we'll catch you soon. All right, brother. All right, see you.